Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter, podcasts that resonate. It is week two of the school year. And if you live in Canada's largest city and have school-age children, you might already have a couple complaints. Personally, I got a note about a school near my house that has a pool, but no swim instructors. So the kids have no swim class. At my own daughter's school, they've sent us not one, but two separate requests for donations already. One of them is for a snack program to help make sure the kids aren't hungry while they're learning. Another is for a carnival which will raise money for what the school calls enrichment initiatives, which include, I'm reading here, science in the classroom, coding, and literacy supplies. Literacy supplies are now extra, I guess. Listen, I'm telling you this not to complain. We live in a fairly well-off area many parents can afford to give, and our kids will be fine. I'm telling you this to put a personal face on what the largest school board in the country is dealing with right now. Now, I've mentioned some fairly small things, but there are much bigger issues all across the Toronto School Board. There are health and safety issues. There are staffing shortages. There are equipment shortages. And every single semester, trustees and teachers and principals are choosing what to cut and what they can keep, but never what to add. So how did it get this way? Well, it happened over decades. And this story is not just a Toronto story. It's happening elsewhere in Ontario, and it could happen anywhere to any school board. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Wensi Leung is a reporter with The Local who looked into uh, the education system at large, I guess, in Toronto, uh, Wensi, and uh, (laughs) how bereft it is at the moment. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Jordan. Of course. I wanted to start... um, I know this changes from province to province, but in Ontario, how is education funded and um, how did it used to be funded? What was the major inflection point? So pre-97, school boards were funded by a mix of provincial funding and also they could independently raise money for themselves through municipal taxes, through property taxes. And then in 97, this was after Mike Harris came into government. Right, the common sense revolution. That's right, yeah. So they made a very significant change to the funding model in which the province took hold of the purse strings for school boards. And school boards weren't able after that to kind of independently access property taxes on their own and raise money for themselves. So the province essentially kind of doles out buckets of money to these school boards for X, Y, and Z. and What the province really did was also uh, define what education funding means. And that was really kind of narrowed down to uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic, that kind of like back to basics type of education. What that means today for schools is that like you'll have parent councils, for example, that have to raise money if they want the playground to be upgraded or they want special science programs in, in their classes. The schools kind of rely on parents to fundraise for that. Mm -hmm. So what that means, though, is that certain schools that have the fundraising capabilities are able to have those kind of things, and schools that aren't, they just don't. Why would the province have made this change? I know it was controversial at the time, but what was sort of their reasoning for changing the funding model? I guess sort of ideologically, it was a sense of trying to rein in school board spending from the big boards. That kind of goes back to the idea of like getting back to basics. Mm -hmm. The other thing was to really kind of bring school boards into the control of the province. The other thing, too, that was happening at the time was an emphasis on reducing taxes. Another rationale for kind of having the province take on the purse strings of education funding was that when local boards were able to raise their own uh, money through local taxes, There was also uh, quite a bit of inequity between boards in rich areas where they could raise a lot of taxes and boards in sort of rural areas where they couldn't. And so there was sort of 
or rationale for trying to um, level the playing field. From what I've heard, though, is what was thought to be sort of a leveling up of everybody to get everybody on the same playing field, it, it, it kind of ended up being a leveling down, um, especially for the big boards. So underneath that uh, fundamental change to the funding formula is the Education Act that governs how boards uh, spend this money. Maybe just explain uh, what it says about how school boards have to approach their budget. So the Education Act is kind of a living thing, so it continues to change. I guess, you know, one of the fundamental things about the Education Act that kind of really hampers school boards is the idea that they have to have a balanced budget. So under the the section on balanced budget, it reads that a board shall not adopt estimates that indicate that the board would have in-year deficit for the fiscal year. So while they have these buckets of money that come from the province that determine how much money they get, they also have to make sure that they don't spend more than they're allotted. You guys have been reporting for a long time now on the ground uh, at schools across uh, the Toronto District School Board. What have you seen and heard about uh, the impact of the funding model over the years? I think, you know, what is kind of most distressing is the fact that it's just an accumulation of, of issues. So, On the one hand, there's like the physical things that are going on at schools. So you have crumbling infrastructure where you have, you know, schools that don't have air conditioning and, you know, the summer heat waves are are getting worse and earlier in the year. You have a lack of proper ventilation and, you know, windows that don't open, which is a huge issue when it comes to uh, COVID waves. You have, you know, dirty toilets and unkempt school grounds. You have flooded playgrounds and roofs that leak. On the other hand, when it comes to things that are less visible, you have a lot of educators and people working within the schools who are just completely burnt out. And they're just not able to keep schools safe and clean and meet the needs of of the students. Is there any way, because I know everybody who's in and around the city, who has children in schools or even just knows somebody who works in them. We all have anecdotes about where this kind of lack of funding shows up. But is there any way to quantify um, whether or not the Toronto School Board lacks funding, you know, compared to other school boards? When it comes to the Toronto District School Board, what they have done is they put out a document called Financial Facts that goes back about five years where they do actually show the funding gap for each year. It's a, the difference between the amount they get from the province and what they actually need to spend. And the most recent year, that funding gap was probably around $200 million. When it comes to the school boards in Ontario, from what I've heard, um, multiple school boards are in kind of the same position. If you look across provinces, StatsCan has some figures and the most recent is in 2020 to 2021, the amount of spending that goes into schools in Ontario is kind of lower than the Canadian average. So you have provinces like Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Nova Scotia, Quebec, all spending more on their students than Ontario does. When you look even more broadly and look at comparable jurisdictions in Massachusetts or New York State, those American jurisdictions actually spend probably between two to three times as much as as in Ontario. I want to know a little bit more about how those decisions get made. Maybe start um, just by by telling us about Colleen Russell Rollins. Who is she and uh, and what's her dream versus her lived reality right now? Yeah, so Colleen Russell Rollins is a kind of a veteran of the TDSB. She's the director of education for the Toronto District School Board. At a budget meeting earlier this year, you know, she was talking about what could happen with the TDSB if it had enough funding. And the way that she described what could be is really what every parent kind of wishes for their children, which is you know, a place where all kids, including kids who have special needs, can feel like they can belong and to thrive. She mentioned that she'd love to see schools be able to have renewal projects every few years and to make sure that schools are clean and that there's opportunities for the arts and for for business and 
opportunities to kind of work with the community. The reality is just a constant need to sort of find ways to essentially slash the budget and like carve away the pieces that are considered non-essential or less essential, I guess. The staff every year kind of comes up with places where they might be able to save, where they might be able to earn a little extra cash. And the school board kind of brings these ideas to the community and kind of asks for for community input. There's a lot of like marathon sessions between the trustees and, and staff to try to kind of hammer it out. It's really a struggle every single year. How changeable are those decisions like school by school or does the board make a decision on where money goes and it sort of applies to all schools? They do kind of like have that overarching budget and then they they decide on like where the, the school board calls them like envelopes of cash go. In the process leading up to when they pass a budget, things can can be quite fluid. Like, you know, last year they had been considering closing some of the school pools and because of community backlash, you know, they they decided to reverse their decision on that. So it can change, but the issue is like when you spend money in one place, it means oftentimes just taking money away somewhere else. What happens if they just don't balance the budget? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's something that one of the parents that I had spoke to who has been leading a parent's effort to try to get the Toronto School Board to have a no-cuts budget. You know, she was pushing to have the board refuse to balance their budget for this coming year. What that would have meant, though, is that the province would likely have, you know, stepped in, probably would have appointed an administrator to kind of do those cuts and try to balance the budget for them. One of the things that that this parent group was saying is, though, if there was an administrator that was appointed to handle the the TDSB's budget, at least there would be somebody that they could kind of hold their feet to the fire. So right now, what she was saying is that when parents complain to the school board, the school board says, well, we can't do anything because it's the province. And when they complain to the province, the province says, no, no, you have to go to the school board. So it can be very frustrating. And really, there, there does need to be some more sort of accountability and someone to answer to, to these parents. Are there any other options that the TDSB or other boards, I guess, in the province uh, facing this could take uh, that, you know, don't involve obviously a giant influx of cash from the province? Like uh, anything that they could do to use the money differently um, or try to find other revenue streams? I think they're really stuck because the the province is in control of what they get. So like I said, you know, schools can rely on school councils to raise money for things that aren't like the core education, um, the reading, writing, arithmetic and all that. But it really depends on your neighborhood and whether parents are able to to raise enough cash. When it comes to solutions, I don't know what they are yet. We're still doing the reporting and still trying to figure it out. What I've been hearing time and time again is that our society really kind of fails to recognize the importance of public schools as they should. So there's a tendency, I think, to think of public education as something that concerns parents, concerns people who are working in the education system, and concerns students. But I think in reality, uh, the public education system is something that should concern us all. Because in it is where our future citizens are developed, where our future employees are developed, where our future employers are developed. So you don't need to be a kid in the system or a parent or a teacher to be concerned about the actual school system. Really, the socioeconomic health of our communities really depends on it. Well, that gets right at the last thing I wanted to ask you. You know, we talked briefly about uh, the impacts of this lack of funding on schools. What about the impacts on kids? And, you know, one of the things you've mentioned a couple times is the lack of special needs support. I know that there have been stories, I think, including some uh, from you folks, about uh, how difficult it is in classrooms right now. And, um, you know, since the pandemic, how many behavioral problems we've seen uh, in some kids. Yeah, the issue with special needs comes up again and again in the conversations that I've been having with parents and educators. There has been a recent move for inclusion 
and schools. And that means to, instead of have kids with special needs be sort of segregated into their own classes, the idea is to bring them into regular classes. Mm-hmm. The trouble is, however, that in, in doing so, there hasn't been enough support to make sure that these kids have true inclusion. And so instead, you kind of have kids that are sort of abandoned to the regular school teacher. And you have like a teacher who has, say, 30 kids, several of them who need one-on-one attention to be able to thrive. And without the proper staffing, without sort of special needs teachers, without people who can understand and be able to help these kids, you kind of throw it all on the classroom teacher, which is kind of a recipe for burnout and Mm -hmm. it's a lose-lose for everybody. Oh, Wensi, thank you so much for this, um, for all your reporting and looking forward to uh, reading more of it. Thanks so much, Jordan. Appreciate it. Wensi Leung, reporting in The Local, That was The Big Story. For more, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can, of course, always send us feedback on this episode, any episode, or suggest an episode by writing to hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca or by talking to our voicemail recorder. Just call 416-935-5935. The Big Story is available in all sorts of podcast players. And as you may know, if you haven't checked it out yet, a new one called Seeker, S-E-E-K-R. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.